witches and wizards of the world! This is the Hogwarts Chaplain coming to you from the Great Hall! Happy Sunday, my friends, and welcome to the WWN, the Word and Wizard Network. It is Palm Sunday here in the Great Hall, my friends. Palms! For those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Palm Sunday, it, it is the day that the Christian Church reenacts the triumphal entry of Jesus of Nazareth into the temple in Jerusalem. After three years of busy daily ministry in the northern part of the country, Jesus and his followers begin to make their way to Jerusalem, the holy and eternal city. And on Palm Sunday, we celebrate that day on which he arrived for what turned out to be the last week of his life on earth before the resurrection. But the folks didn't know that on that day, and they picked up palms from the side of the road, kind of like a ticker tape parade. And they cheered for the one who'd been the healer and the preacher and the friend and follower of John the Baptist and the one who had raised someone from the dead. They were so happy that he was there. They were yelling, Hosanna, calling him the Messiah. It was a glorious day, my friends, and that is a big part of Palm Sunday. And here at Hogwarts, when they're done with breakfast, we will be handing out palms to everyone. And we, too, will have our Palm Sunday procession. Now, you may say to yourself, what on earth could the story of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince have to do with the readings this week? Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you that the Sunday sermon call this week is actually quite easy because the Half-Blood Prince is the perfect book of all seven books for this, the sixth Sunday in Lent. My friends, it helps us answer a very odd question that I have always had about the readings on Palm Sunday. And the question is this, why is it that we read the whole story of the week, the Holy Week, as Christians call it, ahead of us, and yet next week we're actually going to go through the things that we read about today. We, we will commemorate the Last Supper on Thursday, Maundy Thursday as we call it in the Christian church, but we read about that in the long reading today. And, and then we will read and reenact on Good Friday the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. But even though we're going to do that on Good Friday in a few days, we read about that already today in the reading. So the question is, why do we get the whole story today and then walk through parts of the story next week and then get the whole story again in our readings on Good Friday. Well, my friends, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince is a perfect example of why we do that. Because the sixth book does things in it that has us understand what we find in the last book. The Deathly Hallows exists and its meaning can strike us and can take us over and inspire us. But we were made ready for that by what we read in the Half-Blood Prince. And what we read is a story of someone, Dumbledore, who gives us an image, who is a Christ-like person. But before we go on, we have to say this about Professor J.K. Rowling. She was asked many times when the series was done, is Dumbledore a God figure? Is Harry Potter a Christ figure? And in all cases, J.K. Rowling said no to both questions. She was very aware of the great story by the great wizard, C.S. Lewis, about Narnia and Aslan, and she was very clear and said in more than one interview, I do not have an Aslan in this story. The wizarding world is not Narnia. It was not her intention to create Dumbledore and have you think that he is God, or that Harry Potter is Christ. She did not like this idea, and nor do I, my friends, because when you say that, it, it takes Dumbledore or Harry further away from what we are capable of doing. So sure, many times during the stories, there are all kinds of people, the Weasleys or other people who are Christ-like. That is to say, they make choices like Jesus made choices, but they are broken or fallen people, including Dumbledore and certainly Harry. But she wanted people to see Christ-like characters that you yourself could read of their lives and say, I can do that, or at least I shall try to do that because I'm not imitating perfect people or God. I am imitating people who, like me, are broken, but they are trying to be Christ-like. 
So what you will see in the Half-Blood Prince is perhaps the most profound example of someone who is Christ-like, and that is Dumbledore. Now you may say to yourself, what about Harry Potter? Spoiler alert. And what he winds up doing in Deathly Hallows, a sacrificial act of love with his life. Yes, my friends, we will get there, but that is next week. And by the way, that act does not end in death. There are some people who read the stories who believe that Harry Potter does in fact die in the Forbidden Forest. But I will tell you even this week, before we get to next week's discussion, I do not believe that Harry actually dies. Yes, there is a moment after he's struck by the curse that he is able to have a conversation with Dumbledore, but I do believe the reason Narcissus Malfoy asks him questions about Draco and gets answers while he lays on the floor. That is a sign to us, my friends, that he is alive, that Dumbledore was right, that love is more powerful than that death curse. It did not kill Harry in his crib, nor did it kill him in the Forbidden Forest, because it couldn't. So, what Dumbledore does in Half-Blood Prince is actually, in some ways, a more complete example of being sacrificial with your life for others unto death. So what happens, my friends? Think of the scene where Dumbledore asks Harry to go find the Horcrux, the locket. But before they go, you begin to see signs that there is something about the story of Christ that you're about to see played out in the chapter called The Cave. Before they even leave, Dumbledore makes Harry promise to do everything Dumbledore says, to obey him no matter what, for Harry to give him his word. And not until Harry says, yes, I give you my word, do they even embark on the journey. And then they get to the cave, my friends, that is so dark. In the movie portrayal of this particular story, you actually see all different colors and shapes in the cave. But in the book version, you will notice it says it is pitch black. But they go to the edge of a lake, and then they go through a storm into a cave that is so dark they can barely see. It is only by the light of a wand that they are able to see just the next few steps. My friends, there are signs all over that they are entering into a very dark and a very evil place. But Dumbledore says before they go in to Harry that the creatures that are in there that might threaten them, that will most certainly threaten them when the locket is taken. He tells Harry, remember that these people live in darkness where it is cold. So when the time comes, what we will need is warmth and light. Yes, Harry, he says, we will need fire. He is preparing Harry to go into the darkest place, a level of the inferno, you might say. But remember, they can't even enter the cave until Dumbledore is forced to shed his blood and spread it on the entrance to the cave. My friends, if you had not realized that we were moving into biblical imagery, I hope you realized it then, if you are one to read the Bible. But yes, just like the Passover story, where someone has to spread blood on the entrance way. So that is exactly what Dumbledore does. And Harry tries to stop him and say, well, how about me? Use my blood. And Dumbledore says, no, yours is more valuable. More valuable to Dumbledore or to the world. Think about that, my friends. People who try to say to Jesus, don't do it. Remember the disciples in the very beginning when Jesus starts hinting that Jesus, his life might end? They said, no, 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 don't do that. And they try to save him. Just like Harry tries to save Dumbledore from even the blood. But Dumbledore says, no, rather my blood than yours. So he begins already to image what it is to believe that you want to save the life of someone else, to put someone before you, to love your neighbor as yourself, but also to follow the teaching that there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for your friend. So Dumbledore gives us signs, even as they enter the cave, that that is in fact what he is about to do. And then you remember as they get to that urn that's holding that awful, green, wicked liquid, and they realize someone has to drink it. And of course, Dumbledore says, I will drink it. But again, he asks Harry, you must give me your word. Whatever I say, ignore it. If I fight back and don't want to drink, force me to. And Harry again agrees. And they begin the drinking of the poison that begins to burn 
and then torture Dumbledore. And just like Dumbledore thought might happen, he begins to beg for mercy to stop. But Harry has given his word. He trusts Dumbledore. He trusts the man he knows. And he continues to take those cups, shall we say, chalices? Twelve of them. That's how many it takes to empty out the bowl. Twelve. Notice, my friends, and J.K. Rowling is very aware of this, twelve is a very important number in the Bible. Twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles, and remember, once they lose one because of Judas, they actually replace him. Different ways the Bible shows you that the number twelve represents something complete, the whole family, a whole society, an action that is complete. So she doesn't just pick 12 glasses full of this awful liquid. It's a way to show that Dumbledore is not only willing to do what he can, he's willing to do a perfect, complete sacrifice. Everything that can be done. He doesn't just finish the bowl. He has all 12. So he drinks it and then expires because of what he has done. My friends, Harry offers to drink it for him. But once again, Dumbledore says, it is mine. It is his to drink. He does not let this cup pass him by. He drinks it himself, but not for himself, because he knows he will die soon. He's not sure exactly when, but he knows that. He's not trying to save his own life. He's trying to save Harry's and the whole wizarding world. My friends, notice what then happens after he expires and then Harry tries to wake him with water. Again, the scene Water, the living water. We heard about that in the readings during Lent. So he finally is able to find water that is not like that yucky, emerald, green, poison, dark, magic liquid. But when he takes a little bit of the water, he stirs the inferi, and of course, he is an attack, just like Dumbledore said would happen. But what happens, my friend? Just a little bit of that living water. And Dumbledore stands up and is able to cast the warmth and the heat and the light of fire. He is, you might even say, resurrected. And as a result, he casts away the beings that are attacking them, and they escape the cave. And always remember, my friends, that scene after scene throughout this series, J.K. Rowling has caves or dark places or underground places, places where Harry goes and meets death and darkness or Voldemort or dark magic. And then it's always through light or song or hope or faith that someone or something comes because of the hope that Harry has. And he is pulled out of the Chamber of Secrets or the, the Shrieking Shack, or in this case, that cave. And they come out together into the light led by the fire that both purifies and sets them free. But the Christ-like acts aren't done. Because even when they get to the astronomy tower, Harry does the same thing the disciples say. I want to save you. Let's go to Madame Pomfrey. Let's go to the hospital wing. But Dumbledore is not trying to save his life. He's trying to save the lives of others and says, no, Severus, bring Severus Snape. So Harry takes off to come back only and see that Dumbledore is under threat. Draco Malfoy is trying to kill him. And then Harry is bound by a spell from Dumbledore because Dumbledore knows Harry will not be able to control himself and will try to save him. So bound and unable to move, he watches an incredible scene unfold. Yet another sign of a man who through love saves others. He does not want Draco to kill him. He says, Draco, you are no assassin. Come with me. Dumbledore said, Voldemort cannot kill you if you are already dead. And what he means is, come with us in the resistance. We will hide you. Voldemort will not find you. He asks Draco to trust him. But then when he sees that Draco will not trust him because he is wounded and afraid, he finds another way to save Draco. He gets him to lower his wand by talking to him about choices and about the love clearly that Dumbledore has for him. And it works. He saves Draco from killing him, Dumbledore, from having his, whole, his soul shattered. My friends, that is saving Draco's life from being a murderer, which is a permanent damage to the soul in the wizarding world. But then he sees Snape. Now remember, Dumbledore knows that Snape has made the unbreakable vow to kill Dumbledore if Draco cannot. So by saying, Severus, please, he is sending the message, Severus, kill me now. But because that curse kills Dumbledore, my friends, Snape's life is also saved from the punishment of the unforgivable curse. 
Not only does Dumbledore take all the pain and the torture to the fact that it almost destroys his body in the cave for Harry, he gets onto the astronomy tower, limping and gasping, and saves two more people's lives. But here's the point. Here's why Half-Blood Prince gives a reason, perhaps, for why the lectionary has us hear this whole story before we go into the week and then read parts of the story all over again. Well, you were meant like Harry to sit on Palm Sunday and watch the whole story to see what it looks like to give your whole self to watch a perfect act of sacrifice. Someone who takes on the pain, who does not say, let this cup pass me by, but someone that says, bring it to me, even if I scream at you to not bring it to me. My friends, it's starting to sound like maybe Dumbledore really is a Christ figure. But notice the differences, and they matter for whether or not you and I can make the same choice as he did. He's wise enough to make Harry promise to force Dumbledore to do something if he can't on his own. He knows he's not God. He knows he's not Jesus. He knows when it comes time for him to give his life, he may feel too weak. He may fight it. He makes Harry promise more than once to help him do what he knows he cannot do on his own. Christ did the same thing in that last week. He asked people to stay with him, just to stay awake with him. But the disciples couldn't even manage that. Dumbledore knows he needs help. In fact, the book opens with Snape getting the unbreakable vow. And many commentators believe the reason that happened was because Snape knew that he too, in the end, may not be able to kill Dumbledore. So he actually makes an unbreakable vow to drag him to that point under the threat of death. So there are signs in people like Slughorn or Snape or even Dumbledore throughout this book that no one is Christ, no one is perfect. And to different degrees, there are people who though are trying to do the right thing and needing help from each other. My friends, congratulations if you sat in church today through such a long reading. But remember this, the reason Harry is able in the Deathly Hallows, in the last chapters, of that part of his life, to know what discipleship is, to know what sacrifice is, is because he saw it from beginning to end in Dumbledore's life. And there was no happy ending on the astronomy tower. What happened was Dumbledore's body was thrown off the tower to death. It slammed to the ground. That is how this particular book ends. Snape and the others look like they've won. Dumbledore knows that this was going to happen that there would be the dark mark in the sky. Dumbledore saw it. He knew that this story, the book for this week, would end in darkness. Just like our readings today do not end with the resurrection. They end with a grave and a body and a movement, broken, frightened, hiding. My friends, when you hear the readings today, see yourself like Harry bound, watching a story play out. But the purpose is so that you would now go through the next week having an image in your mind of what it means to be Christ-like. My friends, be a disciple who is faithful, not one who says, yay, and then crucify him. Or Judas, who leaves the procession and midweek betrays Jesus. Or Peter, who says, I will never leave you, and by Thursday night says three times, I don't know who he is. Or the rest of the disciples who are nowhere to be found on Friday. And only women weep while the men are hiding. My friends, we get the whole story today so that you can choose around whose life are you going to form yours. Who are you going to be? It's just like Harry said in the Room of Requirement. Every great witch and wizard has this in common. At one point, they were students just like us. If they can do it, why can't we? The readings for today... The story of the half-blood prince asks you this question. If Jesus could do it, if Dumbledore could do it, and you watch them in the readings for today, you watch Dumbledore and Jesus do it and do it all the way. So that's the question. If they can do it, you have a week to work it out. Why can't you?